Good evening and welcome. All of those of you who are joining us in person tonight, as well as those who are joining us on the live stream. My name is Rosalind Welch. I'm a advisory board of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. I'm also an editor and author in the new project that we'll be previewing tonight. We want to thank um, the Faith Matters Foundation for organizing and publicizing this event. Um, thank you also to Brigham Young University for this beautiful venue here at the Major Building. We are here tonight to um, test run a project that we are really excited about at the Maxwell Institute, a series of short reader's companions or great theological introductions to each book within the Book of Mormon. We'll have much more on that in just a moment. We want to thank our featured authors who are here with us tonight. Um, and most of all, we're grateful to you for being here. Um, our purpose tonight is to um, generate interest and also to provide feedback and discussion for our authors as they develop their manuscripts. We want to note that we'll be having three other events like this, two here in Provo um, later on this summer and one in Boston in the fall. So if you're interested in those, please check our website for more information on those coming. Um, a couple of items of business. Um, this event will be live streamed. Camera is over here. Um, just know that there's a possibility that if there were to be a white shot, if you're here in the front, you may be caught in that live stream. If you prefer to move elsewhere, then you can do that. Um, I don't expect anything bad to happen, but just so. We'll have we'll start out with an opening prayer offered by Morgan Davis, who's a member of our team at the Maxwell Institute and also an, an editor on the series. Um, and then our executive director, Spencer Fluman, will provide um, a brief overview, he's promised, uh, perhaps a cheerleading team or maybe pom-poms um, on this Maxwell Institute Book of Mormon series. After that, I will introduce our three presenters for this evening and then we'll give the time to them um, for a sneak peek into their respective projects. Our loving Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be gathered together as fellow saints this beautiful Sabbath evening to consider the words of those who have thought deeply and with conviction and with, uh, with faith about the Book of Mormon. We're grateful for the Book of Mormon for its ancient witness of Christ and of its invitation to come unto him and for its teachings that point us to him and show us the importance of faith on his name. We pray that tonight we will be edified, that thy spirit will be present here and in the home and heart of each listener so that we may be edified together and that the feedback that will be generated this, this hour will, will benefit the the writing that is going forward at this time. We love thee, we praise thee, and we say these things in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, we are so grateful to have you here tonight. It's my honor to introduce tonight and to announce this series uh, to appear in 2020. We have uh, 12 uh, remarkable Latter-day Saints, scholarly minds, uh, busily at work on 12 volumes treating each book of the Book of Mormon in what should um, ultimately be a remarkable uh, series of volumes to in reintroduce you to the theology of the Book of Mormon. We're, uh, we're grateful for three of those authors to be with us tonight. Uh, to share their preliminary uh, thinking here. The design of this evening is by design. We want them to be in close proximity to you, to hear your questions so that they can gear their work to uh, brilliant but non-academic Latter-day Saints, like yourselves. That was a laugh line, but... <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. You're, you're intense. You're ready. I, I can... I get it. I get it. Uh, we, we really do want them to be responding and interacting with you in these authors meets audience kinds of events so that they can gear their work to you. The, the, the challenge of this series 
is to have brief, accessible volumes that can provide scholarly perspectives, theologically oriented perspectives, but accessible to non-academics. Um, and so it, it is a challenge. These are some of the, uh, this is some preliminary design work for you to kind of uh, get excited about. We're very excited for the series. Brian Krasiznik's original woodcut art is going to uh, be a part of the series, and each of the authors has a very strict word limit, too. They can't go on forever. Uh, they're they're, uh, they're going to keep it tight for all of your, uh, for you as readers. You can get a sense, that I don't know if those in front will be able to read it, uh, but you can get a sense of our, uh, of our authors there, who's going to be working with uh, which book of the, of the Book of Mormon. Uh, we've already started the process of collaboratively working through what the, uh, what the series will look like. The authors met uh, for an author's retreat in the spring. Um, we've decided to let each author kind of craft their own vision for their volume, um, but they're going to be about similarly um, sized, as I said, and each is going to give a kind of unique voice, a unique window into each of those books of the Book of Mormon. So we're hoping tonight that you feel um, authorized to be a part of the conversation. Please write down questions you have while the presenters are presenting. Um, we hope that uh, some of you might choose to return to uh, future events. And ultimately, we hope that you're excited about the series and excited to fall in love all over again with this book of scripture that we all love. That means so much to us, but we're eager to have these scholars as uh, conversation partners with you as you engage uh, the Book of Mormon again next year as part of the church's curriculum. These, uh, these volumes will be released uh, periodically throughout next year, roughly in correspondence with that curriculum. So we hope that you'll get excited about it, you'll talk to your friends about it, and that uh, you'll feel like you're a, a part of the ride as we continue. Uh, thanks very much. Spencer's enthusiasm for this project is boundless, um, and uh, I'm, I will be authoring the volume on Ether, um, and truly, it's, it's infectious, and we're excited about it. Um, just a word on our procedure for tonight, as Spencer mentioned, we um, eagerly invite your questions and your feedback. You all have note cards and a pen at your seats, um, and we invite you to write down questions as they occur to you, no need to include your names or anything like that. Um, at a couple of times during the presentations, there will be Maxwell Institute um, staff members who will be circulating and you can um, pass your cards to them. Um, after each of our, um, after all three of our presenters have spoken, then we will have a period of question and answer um, that I will facilitate here. Um, so please keep your minds and thoughts working and we, we invite your feedback and your questions. Um, oh, and, and just to note, of course, also, we probably won't get to all of the questions that are generated, so um, please don't take offense if we're not able to get to your particular question. Um, so with that, I will introduce our three guests, and um, then we will give the time to them. We will hear first tonight from Joseph M. Spencer, who is a philosopher and an assistant professor of ancient scripture here at Brigham Young University. He's the author of three books, most recently, The Vision of All, 25 Lectures on Isaiah in Nephi's Record, that was published by Cobra um, in 2016. He serves as the editor of the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. He's also the associate director of the Latter-day Saint Theology Seminar, and he's the vice president for the Book of Mormon Studies Association. Joe is authoring the volume on First Nephi for our series, Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon, um, for which project he also serves as a series editor. Uh, Joe and, his, and Karen, his wife, live in Provo with their five children. Um, it's well known to, to those who, of us who work with him that Joe is a prodigious writer. Um, he and Terrell, I think, are co-champions in that regard. He's also a prodigious walker and a prodigious conversationalist. I recently had the um, experience once in a lifetime, I hope, experience of walking about 60 blocks, New York City blocks with him, and talking every step of the way. It was, it was amazing. After Joe, we'll hear from Terrell Gibbons. Terrell, um, as of last month, is Neil A. Maxwell's Senior Research Fellow at the Maxwell Institute. 
Terrell held for many years the Bostwick Professorship of English at the University of Richmond, where he specialized in Romanticism and 19th century cultural studies. Terrell has authored, by my count, um, 15 books, several more on tap, including his volume on Second Nephi for our series. Um, Terrell's scholarly work inaugurated this century's flowering of the academic study of the Latter-day Saint tradition, beginning with his seminal volume, The Viper on the Heart, Mormons, Myths, and the Construction of Heresy, that was published by Oxford um, in 1997, which had historical consequences for all of us here. Um, his work for popular audiences similarly invented a new mode for Latter-day Saint publishers and readers, beginning with the now classic The God Who Weeps, 2012 co-authored with his wife, Fiona Gibbons. I think all of us probably have a where were you when you first read Terrell Gibbons moment? I know that I do. Um, I remember very clearly sitting on my couch nursing my second born baby and reading um, his book, By the Hand of Mormon. Um, it blew my mind. Um, and finally, we'll hear from Mark Raygall. Mark is professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford, where he teaches the philosophy of religion, ethics, and 19th and 20th century European philosophy. Mark has recently finished editing the Cambridge Heidegger Lexicon, and a collection of his essays entitled Phenomenology and Human Existence will be published later this year by Oxford University Press. I remember very well, several years ago, I was trying to remember the exact year, I'm sitting spellbound in a nondescript seminar room, I'm listening to a paper that Mark gave offering a, a new reading of this phrase that's very unique to the Doctrine and Covenant, that humans are agents unto themselves. And I've thought about that paper frequently since that time. Um, so as you see, we're in for a wonderful piece tonight. And with that, I will turn the time over to Jeff. Yeah. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this should be a lot of fun, I hope. So we're live here. Uh, what I want to do tonight, I've only got a few minutes, uh, I want to talk a bit about what it means to read First Nephi theologically. Uh, there are lots of ways we might go about that kind of project. Uh, if this is our question, what to do theologically uh, with First Nephi, uh, a couple of obvious approaches might spring to mind. Right? One would be uh, to choose a set of relatively traditional or perhaps uh, more novel theological um, kinds of categories and so on, and then see how First Nephi casts those. What does it have to say about the nature of God? What does it have to say about the nature of salvation? And so on. That would be one possible approach for sure. Uh, a second would be to look at parts of the First Nephi that bother us, right? things that concern us, and then ask how uh, good high-octane theology might help us to respond to those worries. Got in mind things here like the slaying of Laban, right? theological ethics might speak to this. Uh, the corruption of the Bible. It's described in 1 Nephi 13. Uh, obviously, hermeneutics and the theology of Scripture could speak to this. The relative absence of women. 1 Nephi maybe, in some ways, does better than much of the Book of Mormon on that score. But uh, here, right, feminist theology, what might it say to this kind of concern? Uh, what I want to propose, though, and what I'll be proposing in my own volume, is a different approach uh, to these. Uh, my proposal is this. If we want to understand theologically what's going on in 1 Nephi, we do best to begin with how the book is organized. How is it structured? How does it understand itself, so to speak? And then uh, we can take that organization, if we can discern it, and begin to use it as a kind of key to the book's purpose, its theological intention. So this is what I'm going to lay out tonight, just a brief kind of overview of how the book is structured and what that might suggest about the way we read it when we read it theologically. So can we discern the structure of 1 Nephi? I think the answer is yes. Uh, how to begin? Well, uh, the really interesting thing about the first book of Nephi is it actually uh, tells us a bit about how it's organized. Nephi himself speaks up, interrupts the storyline, and talks about the organization of the book. First time you find this is in 1 Nephi chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which I've got up here on the screen. Uh, notice that early in this verse, he's in the middle of his opening story of Lehi's first visions in Jerusalem, uh, and he interrupts it suddenly in the middle of the story and says, I want to be clear, right? Uh, I'm not making a full account of my father's writings. This is not my dad's book. Uh, 
Uh, and it goes on, as you see the next part in red there, right? I shall make an account of my own proceedings. Uh, this is his book. So this seems strange. Why open with his father's story, as he has? Well, he explains at the end of these two verses here, uh, after I have abridged the record of my father, then, then I'll make an account of my, my, own, story, my own life, right? Uh, so this is what Nephi tells us right at the outset, that he's dividing first Nephi into two halves. A half that is about his father, an abridgment of his father's record, and then some part of it that is going to be his own record. The question we might ask is, can we track where that happened? Can we actually identify the point where we switch from one to the other? And I think the answer is straightforwardly, yes. First Nephi 10 opens with this. Now I, Nephi, proceed to give an account uh, upon these plates of my proceedings. Notice he's using the same language he's already used. He seems to be waving his arms to the reader and saying, part two, right? Now we're moving from the first half to the second half. And in fact, it's even tighter than that. Uh, notice he goes on not just to say my own proceedings, but my reign and ministry. If you flip back all the way to the beginning of First Nephi, this is the subtitle of the whole book. Right? Uh, it's the first book of Nephi, his reign and ministry. Starting in First Nephi 10, we move from an abridgment of Lehi's record to Nephi's own proceedings. And Nephi's making this as plain as he can for us. He wants to see the book as having two parts. So we might say at least this by way of getting started, right? The whole of 1 Nephi, two halves. Part A, part B, the abridgment of Lehi's record, then Nephi's own proceedings, his reign and ministry. Now, so far, so good, but also who cares, right? Two halves, okay, you summarize a bit of your father's story, then your own, what does this matter? Can we get further? I mean, we can already ask a question in light of this. Why would Nephi bother at all with his father's record? Yeah. Why not just tell the story in his own voice from the beginning? Because he's in the story from the beginning. Why bother with Lehi at all? So can we dig into this structure further? I think the answer is yes. To do so, though, we have to look at original chapter. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with this, but when Joseph Smith dictates the Book of Mormon originally to his scribes, uh, he, he dictates chapter breaks that are not the chapter breaks we're familiar with from current editions uh, in the Latter-day Saint tradition. They were broken into smaller chunks in the 1870s. Uh, but those original chapter breaks are, I think, I don't have time to argue it tonight, uh, but I think are very clearly original to the authors in the Book of Mormon. And they organize the text in strikingly important ways when we pay attention to them. Here are the original chapters for 1 Nephi. And we'll go through these in detail, but you can see them there. We read it as 22 chapters, 22 6 a.m. family scripture studies, right? Uh, but as Nephi actually tells the story, it's seven, seven chapters, seven self-contained stories. Uh, and you can uh, identify basically what's going on in each of these chapters. Of course, there's always a bit more going on than just the main central story, but there's always a main central story, right? The original chapter one is the story of getting the brass plates, first Nephi 1 through 5 today. The original chapter two, now we're getting Lehi's dream. The original chapter three, Nephi asks for that same dream and he has this vision. The original chapter four, Nephi's brothers wonder what this dream is about, he's explaining to them. The original chapter five, a journey from Jerusalem all the way to the promised land desert, building a boat, crossing the ocean. The original chapter 6, we got our first substantial quotation of Isaiah. This is when we all stop reading. Uh, and then in the original chapter 7, we get Nephi explaining that to his brothers. They come to him saying, what does this mean? Uh, so seven stories is what he's telling. Now if we uh, map that onto our two halves, this is what the structure of First Nephi looks like. Uh, so we've got a half where we're getting Lehi's story, but notice we're getting it in two parts. There's a story about getting the brass plates, there's a story about getting this dream of the tree of life. In the second half, now we've moved on to Nephi's own proceedings, and what we get there is five stories. Uh, we get the story of this vision that Nephi has, and then a story about him explaining that vision, Lehi's dream, to his brothers. A story of the journey, and then Isaiah, and an explanation of that. Does this give us a clue to the structure? I think the answer is yes. Uh, notice you can see something happening in the second half of the book pretty clearly. Once we've moved into Nephi's own reign and ministry, when he's a ruler and a teacher over his brothers, uh, there are two very clearly parallel things going on. We have two prophetic visions, Nephi's own, when he's asked to have his father's dream, uh, and then this prophetic vision of Isaiah. And the two uh, are set in perfect parallel. In each case, we have Laman and Lemuel coming to Nephi right after it and asking what it means and him explaining it. In fact, in both cases, it's the very same question they ask. Is this temporal or is this spiritual? Nephi's trying to flag for us that these are related. 
And incidentally, uh, when Nephi explains the vision, the dream, to his brothers, he tells us his primary source is Isaiah. It's 1 Nephi 15, 20. And when he's explaining Isaiah to his brothers, very clearly throughout that whole last chapter of 1 Nephi, his source is the dream, the vision. So what he's given us here is two prophetic sources side by side that apparently help to explain each other. This is what we might call then Nephi's reign in ministry. It's two kinds of things, right? On the one hand, his own visionary experience, sort of mediated by Lehi's dream. Uh, and then on the other hand, Isaiah's prophecies. Both of these explained to Nephi's brothers. This is what Nephi's reign in ministry looks like, explaining to Laman and Lemuel these two prophetic sources. Now in light of that, if all of that is right, uh, then we can rethink the first half of the book why have Lehi's story there? Why abridge Lehi's record? Well, there are two stories there. How do we get the brass plates? That is, how do we get the source for the Isaiah prophecies? And then the story of Lehi's dream. How do we get this vision? What we're getting in the abridgment of Lehi's record, it seems, is just a kind of double story of provenance. How did we get the two sources that then form the core of Nephi's reign and ministry? Straightforward. Uh, so these map on perfectly. There's a nice little chiastic structure there. Right? Uh, our original chapter 1 sets us up for the original chapters 6 and 7. The original chapter 2 sets us up for the original chapters 3 and 4. The journey is there because we've got to get to the new world as well. Uh, but it seems clear that this whole book is now organized around two prophetic sources, an old world scriptural record and a new living prophetic tradition that's beginning with Lehi, will be passed down through Nephi prophets. So, uh, the sum of Lehi's record now, this abridgment in the first half of the book, how the family came to possess the brass plates, on the one hand, and on the other hand, how the pathway toward this uh, vision that Nephi receives began. So, there's our structure of 1 Nephi. This, I think, we can discern just right in the text. I don't think I'm making anything up. I'm just looking carefully to see how the thing is organized, and it's tightly, carefully structured. Nephi is not, uh, he's not just kind of throwing stuff on the page. This is not a journal uh, that he's writing day by day. He's had, he tells us in 2 Nephi uh, 5, he's had 30 to 40 years to reflect before he writes this thing. And it's very tightly organized. So the final question, by way of closure for today, for me, I'm not going to not let you listen to uh, <laughs> What's the upshot of all of this for reading theolo uh, theologically in 1 Nephi? If there's a tight, organized structure here, uh, what does it tell us about the meaning of the book? Well, I think we can say at least three things, and all I'll do is introduce these uh, for now, but this is the heart of what I'm writing about. So first, note this. We tend, as we read First Nephi's Latter-day Saints, we tend to read the book as a collection of stories that are all about one thing, right? Faith amidst adversity, being obedient, despite Laman and Lemuel. That's how we tend to read the book, right? It's a series of stories. But paying attention to the structure suggests that it's actually not primarily that. It's primarily, uh, as I put here, two things, right? Uh, it's a, we get in Lehi's abridged record. Uh, it's about introductions, historical introductions, to these two prophetic sources. And then it's an unpacking of these two prophetic sources side by side. How are they interrelated? What do Isaiah's prophecies tell us about this vision? What does this vision tell us about Isaiah's prophecies? Lightning. It's Nephi's word for that, right? Second thing we might say is this, you can't get out of Isaiah. You're trapped, right? Already in 1st Nephi, we tend to think, well, 2nd Nephi, now Nephi's got this weird obsession that you just kind of slog through. But no, already from 1st Nephi, it's clear that the whole project is built on Isaiah. We can't get around this. From the very first moment, everything here is about putting this new living prophetic tradition in conversation with Isaiah in particular. Uh, and the third thing we might say is this, uh, that the central theme of 1st Nephi isn't individual faith. It's not an individual question, though we tend to read it this way. We see Nephi as an example for my individual life. But given the way he's built this, uh, what's happening in these visions, in Isaiah's records, the primary theme in 1st Nephi is covenantal. It's about people. Covenant theology is the subject matter. What is going to happen with the people? Think for a moment of how uh, the first book of Nephi ends. We tend to think of Nephi's story, and we think of it as ending with Laman and Lemuel trying to kill him after Lehi's death, and then Nephi having to run off with his people and start new people. That's second Nephi. But Nephi closes first Nephi with a very different picture. First Nephi ends with Laman and Lemuel with the brass plates in their laps, 
figuring out Isaiah. That's the theological vision of 1 Nephi. What's going to happen in the last day? Laman and Lemuel's children will receive Isaiah and understand the vision, and God will redeem this remnant of Israel. Covenant theology. So, more succinctly put, here are the three upshots, right? This is what uh, I think we have to do. If we want to read 1 Nephi theologically, we've got to begin here. This is the project. We've got to see this thing as about two prophetic sources. What is Isaiah and what is Nephi's vision? What does Lehi's dream really mean? Uh, we can't get away from Isaiah. We have got to read that. And then we've got to think very deeply about covenant theology. Then I think maybe we can ask the other more traditional theological questions, but Nephi is trying to give us a guide to reading. Uh, I hope we listen to him. Uh, I think maybe he's trustworthy on this point, right? Uh, he might be able to teach us how to read his own work better. And I hope we listen. I think we'll find something there. Thank you. Uh, we didn't collaborate beforehand, but I think you'll find that there's a, a, a nice kind of continuity between what Joe has just presented and what I'm going to try to say, although I do admit to a little bit of resentment about his words slogging to him. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, the beloved church historian Marvin Jensen once told an audience that he too endeavored to engage in family scripture study of the Book of Mormon, but he never made it out of the wilderness. <laughs> and so I think in some ways my task in writing this volume is to encourage people and convince them that it really might be worthwhile trying to slog through Isaiah. <laughs> so here's the question that I want to, want to begin with. Um, Joe has said some interesting things about how 1st Nephi ends. I want to talk about how 2nd Nephi begins. Because there's a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a question here as to why Nephi alone, of all the Book of Mormon writers, divided his work into two books. Why did he do that? And I think the clue is going to be found in the opening verses of 2nd Nephi. It's not what we would have expected. He doesn't begin with arrival in the Promised Land, which seems to me a good place to begin a new, a new volume. He doesn't begin with the death of Lehi, and he doesn't begin by quoting Isaiah. That already happened in the first book. So what pivotal moment of crisis or renewal or challenge inspires him with a need to create an entirely new record? And so here, because we are just testing the waters with you, you can tell me if this analogy is too outlandish. But here's the analogy that I come up with. NASA already has a timetable for the colonization of Mars. And according to their projections, sometime in the 2030s, we will be launching manned space flight to Mars. So I'm asking you to imagine that the first colony has been established on Mars. They are self-sustained. It's a fragile, tenuous extension of a home civilization. And then across interplanetary space comes this devastating message, Earth has just blown up and a nuclear conflagration. And I asked you to consider how would you feel as a colonist having received that news? And how would it throw into crisis your sense of self? Who do you belong to? How has that changed your destiny, your identity, your purpose, your future? Well, in the fourth verse of 2 Nephi, something roughly equivalent or analogous happens as Lehi announces to his family, I had a vision, Jerusalem is destroyed. Now, virtually all scholars of the Bible and early Israel say that the Babylonian destruction of Israel, the destruction of the temple and the captivity, was the most traumatic event in the history of Israel up to that point. The only modern counterpart to that would be the Holocaust itself. These are some of the things that um, scholars have said about that moment of crisis in Jewish history. One of the most traumatic periods in Israelite history, all of Israel's previous history and theology were called into question. The Torah, which emerges out of that crisis and captivity, is what turned ancient Israel into the Jewish people by responding to a sudden concern with a the theoretical side of Israelite worship 
And the process requires significant ideological rethinking, resulting in a renegotiated new corporate identity. So I think that what is happening in those opening scenes of Second Nephi is explained by what is happening in the mind of any person observing what is happening to Jerusalem at that moment in time. How are we to understand the covenants, which were our lifeline to God and to a community? And what is our place in it from this point going forward? And the project of Nephi is to answer those questions. And that's why he believes this requires a new book with a new project. <clears throat> I think Moroni understands the project in similar terms, and I think that's why looking at the record that he is now abridged, he says its two main purposes are, in fact, to assure the readership that the covenants are eternal, and to the convincing of Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, to explicate and affirm the centrality of Christ in that covenant, and the contingency of that covenant and its fulfillment on the preserved centrality of Christ in that covenantal understanding. So what do we mean by the covenant? I think it's highly significant and instructive for us that when Joseph returned from the sacred grove, one of the first interlocutors with whom he spoke said that what he remembered about Joseph's experience was that he said he had been told by God that the everlasting covenant had been broken. <coughs> and in the preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord's preface, he himself says, I called Joseph to reestablish my everlasting covenant. So I think as Latter-day Saints, we miss the boat if we think that the covenant is a part of the gospel. That the covenant is the dimension of the gospel that we have to come to understand. No, the gospel is the dimension of the covenant. The covenant is the master framework, the totalizing overall conception of God's plans for dealing with the human family, with roots in a pre-existent world. And that is what Joseph meant by the New Everlasting Covenant. It is that that had to be restored. So how does the Book of Mormon then fit into this kind of a theological understanding? Well, I'm going to try to answer that by addressing four interrelated questions. What is the New and Everlasting Covenant? How was the covenant understood by the time we get to the Old Testament? What was the broken, corrupted covenant that the Lord referred to in his revelation to Joseph Smith? And how does the Book of Mormon clarify the terms of that new and everlasting covenant and restore the plain and precious aspects of it. So first, very, very quickly, this is my one-sentence definition of the new and everlasting covenant that comes from the King Paul Discourse. And Joseph Smith envisions a moment when God, seeing himself surrounded by eternal spirits, invites them into eternal relationship with himself and lays down the blueprint by which this can be brought to pass. And we enter into a covenantal understanding with him in this premortal council, that we will abide by the terms and conditions of that covenant, with the eventuality being that we will be united to him and an eternal family forever. That is the new and everlasting covenant. By the time we get to the Old Testament, as the text has come down to us, stripped of its plain and precious things, essentially covenant is about place, not people. And it's about the here and now, not the there and then. And I think any casual reading of the Old Testament reveals that much pretty clearly, that to this day, right, the Middle East and its politics can be understood largely in terms of this heritage of a covenantal understanding derived from the Old Testament. What is the understanding of the covenant and covenant theology by the time of Joseph Smith? Covenant theology is one of the most commonly invoked and conveyed terms in the entire Protestant tradition. And if you were to Google, for example, New and Everlasting Covenant, or Everlasting Covenant, or Covenant Theology, in 19th century books, you would find literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples. So when Joseph is making reference to the Everlasting Covenant, that is a term that would have resonated universally with everybody, but it would have meant something very, very, very different to a Protestant audience. Because Covenant Theology, as understood in the Protestant world of Joseph Smith's day, is largely... It can be subsumed under the category of what today is called supersessionist theology, which has largely been repudiated since the Holocaust. But for hundreds and hundreds of years, Christianity defined its covenant theology in terms of a failed covenant that God made with Adam, and then with Abraham, and then with Moses, 
and the Israelite people, but each one in turn failed to observe the conditions of this covenant of works. And so God does away with that covenant and replaces it with an utterly new covenant, which is the covenant of grace. And this is a kind of diagram of how covenant theology was defined across scores and scores of theological treatises, going all the way back into the first Christian centuries. Adam, um, missing a couple of words. Adam was the participant in the original covenant replaced by Christ, historic Israel, which comes to be replaced by spiritual Israel. The Old Testament is completely displaced by the New Testament. The Mosaic law is replaced by the gospel law of grace, and tribal covenantal relationships are replaced by personalized covenantal uh, relationships made between the individual convert and Jesus Christ. That's covenant theology in a nutshell that was prevalent in Joseph Smith's day. So, there we go. My question then, how does the Book of Mormon clarify the covenant or redefine it or renew and reconstitute it in Second Nephi? Well, Adam and Christ both became, become part of the same covenant, right? According to modern revelation, the full covenant is made with Adam in the garden. And, and Nephi is at pains to show, repeating um, select verses from Isaiah repeatedly to the point that historic Israel and spiritual Israel, both are participants in the covenant, and that both will be united. That the Old Testament, New Testament, even the chronology is comprised within the Book of Mormon historicity, right? We begin 600 years before Christ, and it's extended to 400 years after. The Mosaic Law and the Gospel Law coexist, and in fact are integrated. So we have those many remarkable scenes in the Book of Mormon where they are living the Law of Moses, even as they anticipate the coming of Christ. And tribal and individual covenants are also synthesized. The uh, best example of that is probably under King Benjamin, where we have covenant people, we have the concept of Zion, but it is the individual who is making that covenant in relationship with Christ. So one way of understanding the Book of Mormon project, as, Joseph, as Nephi largely accomplishes it in 2 Nephi, but it pervades the entirety of the book, is the entire collapse of those polarities and distinctions into one new and everlasting covenant as it existed in the beginning. And um, Jeremy, give me a two-minute one if I'm getting close, will you? Uh, the second part of this project then was to indicate that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, and that he is the centerpiece and point of the entire covenant. And one, thing I just, one point I just want to make here is that the centrality of Christ, the covenantal understanding, this is what is really so beautiful about the Book of Mormon. It's not theoretical and it's not theological. It's personal and experiential. And so we have in 2 Nephi the personal attestations of Nephi and of Jacob and of Lehi, that they have personally encountered the cross. And I think that this is very much to Nephi's point, that our covenant, our participation in, the, participation in the covenant has to be an individuated, personal, experiential participation in that covenant. In addition, there are many plain and precious things that are restored that further flesh out and enhance this covenantal understanding. I don't have time to go through them, but um, these are some of the highlights that, that I will be treating in my introduction. Favorites culpa, in other words, if the project of human uh, immersion in crucible of pain and suffering and experience was designed from the beginning, then the fall is fortunate. It was planned. It was intended. This is, to my mind, the most distinctive and distinctively non-Christian idea that we find in the Book of Mormon. What surprises me as a historian is that nobody seems to notice that. No one, no one, no one. This is really a, a, a radical innovation. The atonement, uh, I love the word, the first English translation of the Bible by John Wycliffe used the word reconciling rather than atonement. And that's the same word that, that Nephi uses. Be reconciled unto Christ. Or as Julian of Norwich would say, be at one with him. We have to engage in this project of oneing. And so I think we get this beautiful new light shed on the notion of atonement itself. The centrality of agency, opposition in all things, the most malign, misused, miscontextualized book in all of one discourse. Um, I don't have time to talk about how Nephi is using that there, but it's really quite interesting. The doctrine of Christ, the most interesting thing to note there is that, is that Nephi explicates re, um, baptism before he explicates repentance. And I think the reason for this is that for Nephi, as for early Latter-day Saints, by the way, baptism was primarily an ordinance of adoption. 
it was not primarily an ordinance of, of repentance and forgiveness. It was an ordinance of adoption into the covenant. And it initiates us in what I would like to call heart education, which is a more literal translation of metanoeo. So it's not about repenting and then being baptized. It's about becoming implicated in this covenant and then initiating this process of re-educating the heart so that we can be at one with Christ. And that's the doctrine of Christ, which culminates with his remarks on feasting on the word of Christ. And my point there would be feasting means to assimilate, to take into ourselves and appropriate for our own uses. And of course, that's what we see Nephi doing repeatedly with Isaiah um, in, in what has sometimes been referred to as <coughs> midrash. And I want to end with just one statement, because I think it's, to my mind, one of the most tender and poignant in all of Second Nephi, and it's the words with which he ends his account. He says, I do, so if you don't mind me reading it, he, he, he tells his audience, you don't have to believe me, you don't have to believe my words, but at least believe in Christ. And to my mind, that is a pure-hearted desire, because more important than vindicate, vindicating ourselves or our faith or our own understanding of the gospel is the greater task to which we are called to direct others by word of belief to Christ the healer. Thank you. Uh, you'll recognize that Alma doesn't come next <laughs> sequence, um, but this date worked best for the Oxford calendar to allow me to, to come over here. The defining event in the life of Alma the Younger, the, the instant that transformed his understanding of himself and of his relationship to God and to the world, that event was an event of unexpected, overwhelming mercy. The, this experience was so significant for Alma and for his understanding of the doctrine of Christ that it's recounted three separate times in the Book of Mormon, once in Mosiah chapter 27, again in Alma 36, and once more, for good measure, in Alma 38. In the version as told to his son Shiblon in chapter 38, Alma says there are two distinct moments of the Lord's saving mercy. First, that the Lord in his great mercy sent his angel to declare unto me that I must stop the work of destruction among his people. And the second aspect or moment of mercy that Alma experienced on that fateful day was the transformative mercy of forgiveness. In the chapter 36 version, he describes it at great length. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights here. My soul was harrowed up to the greatest degree and racked with all my sins. I had murdered many of God's children, or rather led them away unto destruction. The very thought of coming into the presence of God did rack my soul with inexpressible horror. Oh, thought I, that I could be banished and become extinct, both soul and body, that I might not be judged of my deeds. I remembered also to have heard my father prophesy unto the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. Now as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me. And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Alma's conversion to Christianity, in other words, was fundamentally marked by the disparity between the judgment he deserved and the mercy he received. As a result, it perhaps should come as no surprise that the tension between justice and mercy was the central feature of Alma's understanding of Christianity, and uh, it really comes to uh, a point in Alma 42. It holds the key to understanding all of Alma's other teachings on faith, the atonement, and the resurrection and judgment. But before saying more about the doctrine of justice and mercy in Alma 42, let's do a little philosophy. I want to set the stage for Alma's approach to the problem. St. Anselm, writing in the 11th century, posed the following questions. 
But how do you, God, spare the wicked if you are completely and supremely just? Or how does the one who is completely and supremely just do something that is not just? And what sort of justice is it to give everlasting life to someone who deserves eternal death? How then, O oh good God, good to the good and to the wicked, how do you save the wicked if this is not just, and you do not do anything that is not just? So the problem, as Anselm understands it, is this. God is supposed to be both completely and supremely just, but also merciful. It seems like a perfectly just being would always give people exactly what they deserve, but a merciful being would relieve people of suffering. So if God is merciful to the sinner, he's not giving them what they deserve, and thus is not just. And if he is just, he can't be merciful. Let's try to formulate this problem a little more precisely. Uh, let's call a state or situation in which each individual has what he or she deserves, a state of justice. We can distinguish from that an act of justice, which, speaking loosely, consists simply in giving to someone what he or she deserves. To be truly just, the act can't be motivated by any thoughts of selfish gain must be an expression of the desire to produce a state of justice. So a little more formally, we can define an act of justice in this way, where agent A must choose between two or more options that differ in the degree to which they give agent B what he deserves, then A acts justly if and only if A chooses the option that most closely approximates what B deserves. So suppose Joe steals Terrell's wallet um, Judge Rosalind has to choose whether to keep, give the wallet back to Terrell and punish Joe or to let Joe keep it. She will act justly if she gives Terrell what he deserves, his wallet, and if she gives Joe what he deserves, sends him to jail. And she's motivated to do that for the right reasons. All right, now how about mercy? Speaking loosely, an act of mercy is an act that relieves another's suffering without regard to desert. It's important that this act be motivated, again, in the right way, namely by compassion for the sufferer. For instance, if I act to alleviate the suffering of another because I want to impress you, I want you to praise me for my kindness, I'm not truly merciful. And to put it more formally then, where agent A must choose between two or more options that differ in the degree to which they relieve A B's suffering, then A acts mercifully, if and only if, first, A chooses an option that relieves bees suffering more than at least one other option, and so mercy can come in degrees. And second, A is not otherwise obligated to choose that option. So again, altering the example a little bit, uh, suppose Terrell beats Joe and leaves him by the side of the road where Rosalind finds him. She can choose between passing him by or helping him. She acts mercifully if she chooses to stop, find up his wounds, and get him medical care but this doesn't count as a merciful act if she's otherwise obligated to help him. Say, if she's an EMT and she's getting paid to respond to Joe's emergency. All right, so we can see, even from the more informal definitions, that there's a high potential for conflict between what justice would require us to do and what mercy would encourage us to do. And in fact, the conflict is real in the case of Alma the Younger, who justly deserves to suffer for the numerous wrongful acts he's committed, but who cries out to God for mercy and receives it as his suffering relieved. If we look at it more formally, putting the, the more formal definitions of justice and mercy up there, uh, we can suppose that amongst the options God has, he can either give Alma exactly the punishment that he deserves, or he can give Alma some lesser punishment. Justice requires that God give him the punishment he deserves. Mercy invites God to relieve his suffering. Since Alma deserves punishment for his sins, if God acts justly, he cannot show mercy to Alma, and if he acts mercifully, he cannot act justly. All right, so how do we reconcile justice and mercy? Uh, there are two tempting ways to try to reconcile justice and mercy. From one side, you might point to cases where the punishment provided for by the law is not appropriate. And then you might uh, suppose that in some particular situation, the punishment the law requires is too harsh, 
And in that case, mercy would enhance justice by encouraging the judge to reduce the punishment to a more appropriate level. But what this attempted reconciliation amounts to is the claim that the punishment is not, in fact, just. If the punishment is not just, then justice itself requires us to reduce the punishment. Mercy has no part to play here. Another strategy might be to argue that it's appropriate to temper justice with mercy when the wrongdoer, Agent B, has repented. In Alma's case, for instance, you might think that he's earned mercy by starting to repent. But that doesn't solve the problem. For if the sinner, through her repentance, now deserves to have her punishment relieved, then it would be unjust to refuse to relieve it. In that case, God's forgiveness of the sinner is not an act of mercy, but an act of justice, because he's obligated to the demands of justice to forgive. On the other hand, if the repentant sinner still deserves punishment, say her repentance has not done enough to warrant complete forgiveness, then it would be unjust to not punish her. In that case, mercy is once again shown to be contrary to justice. So it doesn't seem possible that God could be both supremely merciful and perfectly just. Cases like Alma's own seem to present a genuine tension between God's perfect and supreme justice and his mercy. And indeed, Alma and his companions repeatedly described their experience as involving something like a contradiction. For instance, Ammon, one of Alma's companions, described the experience as one in which God did not exercise his justice upon us. This paradox of the potential contradiction between God's justice and his mercy is one of the central doctrinal issues, of course, that Alma tackles in chapter 42. In that chapter, he articulates the conditions under which justice and mercy, despite their inherent tension, can be reconciled with each other. And if those conditions don't obtain, then he says the work of justice would be destroyed by mercy. All right, so what are those conditions? To fully answer that question, of course, we have to turn now to a lengthy discussion of Alma's understanding of the character of God's law and Christ's atonement. And I hope to tackle uh, just such a discussion in my book. But let me close tonight by laying out what I think Alma's basic strategy is for resolving the contradiction between justice and mercy. And I want to emphasize that resolving the contradiction is not the same thing as res relieving all of the tension that exists. It's essential to Alma's understanding of Christianity that there is such a tension. I think Alma's key move, then, is to draw a distinction. He distinguishes between the function of justice, and uh, this is my vocabulary, the function of justice and the aim or purpose of justice. The function of justice is what justice does. The aim of justice is what it's trying to achieve by doing what it does. Alma calls the aim of justice the works of justice. Uh, work in the sense that this is the work or the goal that, that justice is trying to produce. You can see this distinction in, for instance, verse 22 of Alma 42, where Alma writes, quote, justice claimeth the creature and executeth the law, and the law inflicted the punishment. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed and God would cease to be God. Okay, so the function of justice, what justice does, is execute the laws. That's what we've been focusing on so far, the action of rendering to each person what she deserves. But what is the work of justice? What is God trying to achieve by rendering to each her just deserts? The work of justice Alma teaches, I think, are to bring us to a state of repentance. Now, Alma writes, how could a man repent except he sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law save if there was a punishment? Now there was a punishment affixed and a just law given, which brought remorse of conscience unto man. So the function of law is to execute the laws, thereby rendering to each what he or she deserves, but the purpose for executing the laws is to lead us to repentance, to a transformation of our natural state. Uh, Carol was talking about this just a minute ago. And how in particular does God want us to transform ourselves? Well, to become beings who no longer seek after our own interests, but seek instead for mercy, seek to compassionately relieve others 
of their unhappiness. Now surely, Alma writes, whosoever repenteth shall find mercy, and he that findeth mercy and endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, I think we often hear that as saying, he, whosoever repenteth shall receive mercy, and that's true, but for Alma, this is the central lesson of Christianity, namely that the purpose of the law and the name of repentance is to make us merciful, to help us find mercy, to fill our bowels with mercy for others, so that we stop constantly worrying in a self-interested way about our rights and about our justice. As Jesus himself put it, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Thus, when Alma says, mercy claimeth her own, that should be heard as saying, mercy claims all those who are merciful. So God's mercy for the merciful may be in tension with, indeed, in a sense, contrary to the function of justice. But when mercy contributes to the work of justice, when it helps us become merciful, then justice has no grounds for complaint. When the recipient of mercy becomes merciful, that achieves the work of justice. It accomplishes what justice demands. Now, this is emphatically not to say that the repentant sinner no longer deserves a just punishment. There are many cases where the wrongs we do cannot be undone. But as I've suggested, the work of making us merciful, or for the work of making us merciful, the tension between justice and mercy is not something that should be dispelled. Take the case of Alma and his companions. Now they were desirous, we're told, that salvation should be declared to every creature, for they could not bear that any human soul should perish. Yea, even the very thoughts that any soul should endure endless torment did cause them to quake and tremble. And thus did the Spirit of the Lord work upon them, for they were the very vilest of sinners. And the Lord saw fit in his infinite mercy to spare them. Nevertheless, they suffered much anguish of soul because of their iniquity, suffering much and fearing that they should be cast off forever. What tends to make us merciful to others is precisely the simultaneous recognition that we are guilty before the law, that we rightly deserve punishment, but have received a mercy of forgiveness we don't deserve. Alma and his companions had a continuous, ongoing recollection of this disparity that drove them for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Thank you um, to our presenters. Um, thank you to those who have um, submitted questions to Jeremy King, who's been circulating um, here in a moment. He'll circulate once again if you have additional questions directed towards Mark or towards any of our presenters. Please feel free to submit those, and they will be magically transported up here to the front. But we'll, um, we'll start out now um, with our question and answer period. Um, we'll start out with a question that I think um, can be answered by all three of our presenters in um, a unique and personal way, um, and that's part of the design of the series, indeed. Um, and the question is, what does this project mean by theology? Excellent question. Um, <clears throat> do you mind if we just go in order of presentation, and we'll have a brief comment from each of our presenters on that? Uh, what does this project mean by theology? I think the answer is uh, that it's multiple. Uh, part of the reason, I think, to gather 12 different authors on different parts of the Book of Mormon is precisely, and especially not to have a kind of top-down imposition, here's how you will do theology, is to demonstrate that uh, theology, one, is alive in the Restoration, uh, but two, that there's not one way it's got to be done. Uh, so, I mean, I think it was probably clear already tonight, you have three very different ways of approaching these kinds of questions, uh, and, uh, and I think there will be 12 different ways of approaching the question. Yeah. Well, of course, etymologically, right, theology is, just means reasoned discourse about God. <clears throat> and I think my project, my, my approach to it was to take more of a historical theological 
approach, which is to ask what what is the, the kind of contextual field of understanding and sets of presuppositions about the nature of God or relationship to him, etc., in light of which we can make sense of the Book of Mormon and its reception. Uh, thanks. I don't know about the series, but I don't plan to do any theology. <laughs> I'll see if that's what I do. Um, I, I view my my job as a phenomenology of uh, the Book of Mormon, of the experience of the Book of Mormon. I think uh, in, in the presentation I made, for example, it's striking to me how different Anselm approaches the question than Alma does. Anselm is interested in this discourse, this reasoning about the nature of God. That's what drives for him the problem. How can Metaphysically speaking, how can a being which has simplicity and unity uh, contain these apparently contradictory uh, characteristics of predicates? Um, for Alma, it's not a theological undertaking. It's, it's rooted in his experience of mercy, his experience of guilt, his experience of uh, his stance before the law. And, um, and so what I'm trying to do is talk about how uh, how Alma's experience informs our own understanding of our experience um, with God and with the Spirit. So the second question, um, I think can apply to all three of our authors as well, especially to Joe and Terrell, given um, their subject matter. And Mark, you can listen and see if you think you have something to add as well. Um, and the question is, how does a theological study of the Book of Mormon differ from and or resemble such a study of the Bible? Is there a different approach or procedure when one is theologically unpacking the Old and New Testament versus the Book of Mormon? Um, and is there a meaningful difference in the external sources that may be used in this kind of project? Uh, one of those uh, predominant forms of, uh, of, uh, of theology, of biblical theology, uh, is uh, is an approach that says that the, fu the fundamental question for, for a theology of the Bible is the relationship between the two testaments. Uh, and obviously it's a Christian theological project, but uh, what is the relationship between the two testaments? If that's how we understand what it means to do a theology of the Bible, then a, a theology beginning from the Book of Mormon is going to have to be different. Right? Uh, in part because it has to ask not only about the relationship between the two testaments, but then what do we do with this third testament, this other testament? Uh, so I think the resources end up looking different uh, in, in crucial ways if we're thinking about that as a kind of total scriptural project. Uh, but it's also different in that, I mean, Terrell obviously was pointing in these kinds of directions. The Book of Mormon fundamentally questions uh, certain at least received interpretations of the Bible, if not of the Bible itself. And so, yeah, uh, a Book of Mormon theology will look, I think, fundamentally different. As to resources, I'll just add one quick note, and that is, uh, people working on the Bible in a theological vein have 2,000 plus years of theological reflection to respond to. And although, of course, working on the Book of Mormon, you can respond to that, that whole history of theology, no, no question. Uh, there is not a lot of theological reflection on the Book of Mormon available. In some sense, we have to try to invent this uh, in this generation. I'll let that suffice. Okay. So this next question um, is similar, um, and it similarly applies more to Joan and Terrell. Mark, I'm sure the questions for you are rolling in as we speak. Um, how does um, Lehi and Nephi's prophetic tradition, um, as developed in First and Second Nephi and in the Book of Mormon generally, fit into the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament world? Terrell, do you want to tackle this one first, and then Jeffrey? Yep. Yeah. Well. I would, you know, I've, I, I think I've said this before in print and elsewhere, but I, I think that the most important theological contribution of the Book of Mormon is, is, is recuperation of what I call dialogic revelation. In the Old Testament, I challenge you to find any example of any person receiving revelation or visionary experiences who is not a prophet, who is not a nation leader. And yet the point that we get in 1 Nephi chapters 10 and 11 is that God is extending that revelatory power and capacity to all individuals, worried fathers and mothers and, and sons and missionaries and generals. And so I think that there is a decisive rupture with the inherited Old Testament prophetic tradition when we get to the Book of Mormon. Radically, radically different. It's the democratization of, religion, of, of revelation. 
<laughs> yeah, I point in a uh, slightly different direction, though I'm not an author of the tale here. Uh, I think maybe the following mark two places in my performance ends up differing in terms of Lehi and Nephi. I think Lehi is, in a lot of ways, very much ensconced in an Old Testament tradition. When he speaks of the Messiah, he always uses the term the Messiah, the Redeemer. Uh, it's Nephi and Jacob who speak of Christ and of Jesus Christ. Uh, when Nephi, when Lehi has a dream, it's a dream that's all uh, in, in very rich metaphorical symbolic language. When Nephi has the same thing, it's history laid out in plain simplicity. Uh, and Nephi sees this, I think, pretty clearly as inaugurating a kind of new prophetic tradition. He calls it the, uh, the plainness which hath been with me since the time that my father left Jerusalem. So I think you'd be tracking in First Nephi a shift from an Old Testament model not to a New Testament model, but to a Nephite model of prophecy that's very different. The other thing I would add to, and uh, this, there's not enough time to unpack it here, but Nephi has a fundamentally new experience with the Spirit. In the Old Testament, and I think this is true for Lehi as well, the Spirit uh, overwhelms agency, overcomes agency. It carries you away. It makes you do things you don't, have, you don't seem to have any control over. Nephi can resist it, and he resisted it specifically for the first time in the context of slain Laban. Uh, but then also, he, as a result, because he can resist the Spirit, the Spirit talks. And the Spirit doesn't do this in the Old Testament. The Spirit just overpowers. Uh, and this seems to also to create a new kind of theological dimension. The Spirit now speaks in words and talk. This isn't very closely related to theological revelation. Uh, so I think what we're seeing as we shift from the Lehi to Nephi is a kind of transition to a first generation of New World prophetic tradition, and hence very different theological. Okay, here's one for Terrell. Um, how does Nephi's use of Isaiah in 2 Nephi support the clarification of the New and Everlasting Covenant? Well, I can think of a number of specific examples. <coughs> Excuse me, but I, I, I tried to indicate in my diagram that there are a few of them. One is, for example, when he talks about the role of the Gentiles in, in um, how does, what's the language, carrying the... the, the kings and queens upon their shoulders, right, in London, which is clearly seems to suggest that there is going to be a kind of uh, uh, evangelizing of the house of Israel through the restored gospel, and most people were privy to it. So what we see there is the perfect synthesizing of historic Israel, which is brought into the covenant, and figurative Israel, which would be the convert base of the church. So that would be one concrete instance, but I think that there are really many others like that. Here's a question um, for Mark, um, and then I'll also invite um, Terrell and Joe to chime in if they would like to give their perspectives. Um, so Mark, given your kind of phenomenological approach to um, this theological project, what, why would or should Latter-day Saints read a book on Alma that takes this kind of um, phenomenological or, and theological approach to what's happening there? Is there a need that this fills? Why would a Latter-day Saint audience be interested in this project? Um, well, I think uh, I think we're all interested in understanding our own experience. Uh, we're here, I presume, because we have an experience of God in the world. We have an experience of divinity. We have experiences of forgiveness, of, uh, of uh, of revelation, of faith, of uh, our understanding being illuminated, and um, and we want to understand that experience better. Um, we go to prophets because they they teach us how to understand what's going on with us, um, to direct us. Uh, they're exemplars for how to live a life, uh, how to how to be in the world, and how to relate to one another. Um, and um, I. I hope that uh, in in uh, helping to uncover the structure of the experience that Alma and other Book of Mormon prophets have, that that will uh, illuminate our own way of, of relating to God and each other. Do you have something you're not talking phenomenologically, but is, do you see a particular niche or niche that your approach will serve? For any if not. 
<laughs> okay, so here's one for Joe. Um, how does Nephi's revisioning of the Tree of Life story um, implicate the covenant theology being that you identify? Uh, so I think uh, I think a careful reading of First Nephi eight, Lehi's dream itself already points in these covenantal directions. We tend to read the dream as being about a kind of it's a, a kind of metaphor for the plan of salvation, every individual's quest for eternal life or something like that. But I think actually a more careful reading already points in covenantal theological directions. Uh, the question for Lehi at the beginning and the end of this telling of his dream is Laman and Lemuel. They didn't eat. They didn't eat. And at the center of the telling of the dream, uh, when Laman and Lemuel didn't eat is when suddenly there are paths and rods and uh, rivers and all of this stuff is suddenly cropping up at that moment in the dream. And it's only at the very moment that Laman and Lemuel don't eat that Nephi, or sorry, that Lehi suddenly sees vast multitudes. And I think the most obvious interpretation of what's going on there is the vast multitudes aren't all of humanity. He's seeing Laman and Lemuel's descendants. At the moment they don't eat, now there's a rod, there's a path. They're going to need a book. They're going to need scripture that's going to get them there. A book will be sealed. It'll come forth in the last days, and they'll be able to get to the tree and come to know their Redeemer again. So I think already in Lehi's dream, covenant is there. And what you're getting in Nephi's vision is a plainer unpacking of the same thing, how Gentiles are going to be involved in this bringing forth of a book in the last days to save the women. Okay, um, for Terrell, um, this one is from one of our online audience members. Um, how can Second Nephi inform or enrich our modern temple experience, according to your reading of the book? Okay. <laughs> we'll give Terrell a moment to ponder on that one. Um, meanwhile, I'll direct this one towards Mark. Um, who do you see as sort of the forerunners or the um, the earlier scholars for the project of theologically reading the Book of Mormon? Whose shoulders are you standing on in this kind of work? Um, this is for Mark, and then I also would open this to the other scholars as well. Well, um, so it, it might be obvious. I'm not heavily invested in, in uh, Mormon studies. I, I'm not a, a Mormon scholar. Um, I, so the answer is within the Mormon community, no. Uh, I'm, I'm approaching the book, um, reading it um, alongside all of you. Um, now, um, obviously I have some training that, that kicks in. Uh, I'm, I'm a philosopher. I teach philosophy of religion. I teach theology to Oxford undergraduates. Um, and, uh, and I'm very interested in... Um, the phenomenology of religious life, and, and there are a number of, uh, of uh, philosophers that have informed me. But I don't, I don't actually uh, see myself as applying them to the Book of Mormon. I think, I think that's the wrong way to do it. I, I think what's important about the scriptures and, and, and the danger of of a um, developed theology, the way the Christian tradition has, is that the theology gets in between us and our experience of the sacred text. Um, that's the danger. So when we're doing this right, it doesn't, the, the theology doesn't become the target of our attention. It becomes a, a means to help us understand what it is that we're reading. Uh, and, and that's what I hope to achieve. So it should be short on footnotes. Um, I do plan to, uh, to, to read what other scholars had to say about the Book of Alma, but I haven't had. And, uh, and so this is fun. Do any of you want to comment on the scholarly tradition and which you yourself for it? Or, or not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, Doug, did you want to say anything? Um, I mean, I think my answer is similar to Mark's. Uh, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll add just one note that, uh, at least for me, the, the exegetical tradition, that is, People who have just commented on the meaning of the text uh, is important, uh, and um, and there isn't much of that, right? We haven't done a lot of that work, but what there is, I want to be generous and 
and recognize those who have really helped us to read the text better, though I don't think many have read it theologically. Yeah. Well, I know a number of people have written about temple texts in the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> and I, that's not an angle that I, that I pursue, but I can just say in kind of general terms, I go back to the remarks I made about how baptism is characterized by Nephi as an initiatory, an adoptive ordinance. And as I understand the temple and temple theology, what is happening in the temple is that we are uh, performing and engaging in covenantal behavior that ties us, binds us more and more and more closely to, to the divine family. If you think about baptism as the initiatory, then we make um, more and more, I guess you should call them kind of covenantal uh, obligations that we undergo until the culminating experiences have to be the sealed, right? And I think that the fact that, that each speaker in Second Nephi, each prophetic voice, personally attests to their actual encounter with Jesus Christ. And if you think of those of you who are temple of Latter-day Saints, if you think about the culminating experience in the temple, it is all atonement-centered and Christ-centered. And so I think in that fairly general way, we are being invited to participate in that same kind of a progressive union with Christ through the five token models. <clears throat> Okay, so these um, these next two questions I'm going to sort of combine into one for Joe, and they both involve um, features of the text that you maybe didn't um, treat in your admittedly very short introduction here. Um, so one of them says, um, First Nephi 1 through 9 seems to be a lot of Nephi's own record, not an abridgment of his father's record record here, talking about the Laban story, etc. Um, and so what does that say about your overall argument? of the theological organization of 1st Nephi 1. And the other one um, asks you to deal with the long intro to 1st Nephi, which focuses on travels in the wilderness. And so does this, you know, um, this material on the travel in the wilderness support your idea that Nephi had a tight structure in mind focused on prophecy and explanation when he started 1st Nephi, when he composed 1st Nephi? Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, I think this is a really important point. When Nephi tells us he's going to give an abridgment of Lehi's record, he nonetheless, I mean, Lehi's not in the picture for full modern chapters at a time. Uh, so that seems peculiar. Uh, I think we should trust Nephi to be straightforward when he says, this is the abridgment of Lehi's record, and then he proceeds to his own proceedings. Uh, so uh, I think that the, the point here is to say Lehi's record covers this time period or something like this. We don't have access to Lehi's record, so I don't know. I think we have to do a lot more sort of textual work to see exactly why Nephi calls it that. Uh, but uh, whatever he's calling it, it seems clear what it's doing, right? So even if Lehi's, uh, abridgment of Lehi's record is a somewhat awkward way of describing it uh, uh, on Nephi's part, it seems clear that, that those first nine chapters, as we have them now, are getting these two sources on the table. Uh, as for travels in the wilderness, yeah, the, there's a, a long paragraph heading over the top of 1st Nephi, uh, and it focuses primarily on travels and that kind of thing. And of course, that original chapter 5, which is now mostly 1st Nephi 16 through 19, uh, deals with that as well. And I don't know exactly what to make of that, because when Nephi sits down to write it first, is that his plan originally is to write a kind of historical record, but then something takes shape? Uh, is the heading written by somebody else? Uh, Nephi speaks in the first person at the end of it, so it seems it's him, though I suppose someone could have added that. Uh, it's not exactly clear why there's such a historical emphasis in the heading and then in the one chapter that it seems sticking out uh, of the structure, but there's, yeah, there's, there are more questions to ask about the structure. But I think the, the rest of it is so clear, so just uh, patently clear that uh, it's pretty clear that's what Nephi's up to. Okay, so here's um, one that I'm going to pitch to Mark. Um, so will your, will your book, Mark, um, will it address ethics in any way, applying theology to living the gospel in our day? Um, well, yeah, I think so. I think, I think um, ethics in the broad sense is concerned with how we live our lives. Um, um, it's much broader than, than morality narrowly conceived. Um, I think that that's what the scriptures in general and the Book of Mormon in particular and especially the Book of Alma is very much concerned with. Um, 
It's interested in what it means to live a life of faith, what it means to um, to bear responsibility uh, to one another for the things we do. Um, it talks about the kinds of uh, moral and ethical responsibility we need to take upon ourselves if we're emulating Jesus Christ and following his example. So, um, so it, it, uh, talking about this ought to be a richly ethical undertaking. Okay, uh, for Terrell. Um, Terrell, how does your framing of the New Everlasting Covenant um, and your sort of drawing out of Second Nephi's covenant theology relate to the way that the phrase is used in Doctrine and Covenants section 132? It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another one and it might be worse, so you might want to take it off. <laughs> But of course, if you want to think. Well, well, of course, right. You know, everlasting covenant of marriage, section 132, but then we also have which is section 122, which refers to baptism as the new everlasting covenant. Yeah. So it seems clear that what's happening here is that, is that all of these are iterations or stages in the totalizing covenant. Marriage is one, baptism is one. Those are all, as I said, this, this sequence of ordinances, all of which culminate in that solidification of the eternal family. <clears throat> Just give us one moment here for conferring. Can, can, can I say something? Yeah, I just want to go back to an earlier question because I didn't feel like I answered adequately about, about Second Nephi um, and his use of Isaiah and, and, and how this takes us back to the New Evangelism. I just want to say something that I think is really, really remarkable about what's happening in Second Nephi. If we think about contemporaneous with what's happening in church history, there are two stories that are unfolding at the same time. There's, there's the, you know, what's happening in the Book of Mormon is Joseph Smith's transmitting this record. There's what's happening to Joseph Smith and the Saints um, shortly after the Book of Mormon is, is published. But in both cases, what happens is New Covenant comes to be redefined after a moment of crisis. And here's what I mean. What is the equivalent of the destruction of Jerusalem in the Latter-day Saint history? Right? It's the failure of Zion's camp. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the moment when the, the hopes and aspirations of the saints collapse in, in ashes. We thought this was something. We thought we were going to possess the promised land. And after all these years in the wilderness, attempting this rescue mission to, 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 to be, and, and it fails. And what revelation comes to Joseph Smith when he's on fishing group? The revelation that comes effectively says, you missed the point. It's not about a promised land, it's about a promised people. Now go back and build your temple. And notice what has happened to Second Nephi, right? The travails in the wilderness, they've lost the promised land, but God has promised them a new promised land. They seize, they have the land, they possess it. And then what happens in Second Nephi? They're exiled from their new promised land. Two devastating exiles in sequence. And what seems to be the way in which that Nephi comes to read Isaiah is that it's about a people of promise and not about a land. Okay, we're gonna um, we're we're coming to the end of our time now. I have a question here um, that applies to all three of our um, presenters, so I'll ask them each to give um, a brief comment on this, and this can kind of be your closing remarks. Um, after that, I'll answer a couple of questions, and finally, um, we have one for Spencer. Um, so, um, here's this general question for all three. There, there are limitations in what historical, linguistic, and cultural analysis can be done of the Book of Mormon, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Bible, right? Um, is an exploration or analysis of the theology of the Book of Mormon the richest thing that, indeed, the Book of Mormon offers? Any thoughts on the Book of Mormon's limitations in other areas of analysis? Yeah, if I want to be provocative, I'd say... Uh... The fact that we don't have access to the gold plates, any original languages and so on, is almost in some sense a dare to begin with theology. And, uh, to begin there instead of trying to get back behind a text and reconstruct something that in some sense God has placed a seal on from the very beginning. Uh, we're supposed to read the thing as scripture, right? How does this thing speak to our lives? How does this speak to our actual experience with God? Uh, and that's a theological question, right? And I think it's clear that most of us here are not talking about theology, it's systematic theology or something like that. Theology is trying to reflect on, on what it is to experience and encounter God. Uh, 
So I think I think that's maybe one way to to approach it. But precisely the fact that we don't know exactly where this took place. We can take guesses and very educated guesses, right? Uh, the fact that we don't have any original languages to work with, though maybe we can reconstruct them. Maybe we should start with English and reflect on what it's saying theologically first. <clears throat> yeah, I certainly don't think that a theological approach exhausts or even exploits the best that the Book of Mormon has to offer. I happen to be personally very much vested in theology because I'm particularly impressed by what I think is a theological richness and coherence of Joseph Smith's restoration theology and his kind of parallel in the intellectual universe. However, having said that, I think that ultimately the significance of the Book of Mormon was best captured by the book John Green Leaf Whittier in the 1840s when he was asked, how do you account for the phenomenal growth of these Mormons? And he said it's the Book of Mormon, because the Book of Mormon spoke a language of hope and promise to those who were seeking in vain for some manifestation of the prime of power. In other words, <clears throat> the Book of Mormon it seems to me presents itself to us in such a confrontational way. Its claims are so outrageous, the motives coming forth is so bizarre and absurd that it forces us to engage it in a very personal way and find out if this is in fact a and evidence of a God who has again opened the heavens or not. And that's why I think that dialogic revelation is the thread that, that is the most persistent, important thread throughout the Book of Mormon from the first pages to, to, to Mormon Eyes Promise. What he's saying is this book is not, it's, it's not valuable by virtue of its content, but it's valuable to the extent that it is a prompt to you to put these things to the test. So. <coughs> Yeah, I don't know how much I have to add. I think that um, I think the, the biggest obstacle to uh, to reading the scripture, one of the biggest obstacles, is is thinking that we know what they mean, um, and that prevents us from really engaging with it. I, I think reading the scriptures is a kind of sacrament. It's a kind of uh, doing something, bringing yourself into proximity with the Word of God, and letting it unsettle you and disrupt uh, your certainties and your sureties, and, uh, um, and uh, I, I hope that, uh, that as interpreters will we'll be contributing, that it will make it possible to, to re-engage with this amazing book and uh, allow it to speak to us. I don't, um, yeah, I, I don't think that um, a lot of the scholarly work that's done on the Bible necessarily contributes to that kind of engagement with the Bible. I know that a lot of the, the philosophical, theological work that's done with uh, with uh, the, the Bible is an obstacle to that, um, and so maybe it's an opportunity uh, that, that it's not uh, it, it's just not possible for us to engage with the Book of Mormon text in that way, um, so that we can stop being distracted and, and allow the, the book to speak to us in the way that it ought to. Okay, there's a, there were a few questions just on the specifics and the particulars of the series, which I will um, address. Um, there was a question about the intended audience for the series. Um, we see the intended audience for the three theological introductions as largely um, overlapping with um, our more general audience for the Maxwell Institute, and that is educated Latter-day Saints, um, most of them probably coming from a non-scholarly background, but interested in the life of the mind um, and ready for um, fresh and learned takes on the gospel. Um, the page length, we are, um, if you're familiar with the Oxford University Press's um, very short introduction series, that in some ways that's an inspiration for this series as well, so the volumes will be slim, um, about 25,000 words. That would be 150 pages around there, yeah. Um, so we, we expect them to be energetic, brief, um, and readable, but very rich, we hope. Um, there was a very interesting question. Um, is there a Mormon for this project? That is, is there a, an overall sensibility, an overall mind, one single person who will be overseeing um, the series tasked with enforcing theological consistency or orthodoxy among the various contributors? Um, we don't intend the series to be um, an exhaustive or a systematic treatment of the teachings of the Latter-day Saint tradition. I think that was evident in our presentations tonight. Nevertheless, of course, 
um, we expect them to be in harmony with the teachings of the Latter-day Saint tradition. So to that end, um, Spencer Fluman is the general editor of the series. His eyes will be on every single word that comes out. Um, we also have five different series editors, each of whom will be um, engaging very closely with a batch of the manuscripts um, and helping to shepherd them along the way. Um, in addition, we have the Maxwell Institute has an imprint board with five members whom we turn to um, to help us with precisely these questions of what direction should we go um, and, um, and how do we most effectively reach our audience, our Latter-day Saint audience. So there will be many eyes, many Mormons, and many eyes on these manuscripts. Um, and as in tonight, we also hope to engage quite broadly with our possible future audience and get your perspective as well. Um, so we, it's, we are very hopeful that with all these eyes on the manuscripts, um, we will end up with a, a product that is um, along the lines um, that Mark was saying that can open our eyes in a new way um, to this book that is um, far more than just an historical record. It's a book that asks something of us, that calls us to repentance, and that um, can speak directly to our hearts and our own religious experience. Um, and finally, I've got one for Spencer over here. Um, <laughs> seeing very clearly that no one on the author list is normal or average, <laughs> to take that a little personally, <laughs> how will you know that the books are accessible to the non-scholar at the end of the project? We'll see. I, this is an experiment. Um, we, we're, we're in space that is uh, not always easy to hit. The series reflects, though, the larger commission that has fallen to the Neil A. Maxwell Institute at BYU, and that is for Latter-day Saint scholars to consecrate their gifts, their particular training, which is not normal, and it's not average. You're right. I, I love the way that was. That question was framed. By the way, kudos to whoever did. Um, these are these are folks with a particular set of skills uh, that that offer a different angle at the text than others might. They, we certainly don't claim to offer a perspective of prophets and apostles, for instance. We're not coming. We didn't call it uh, official doctrinal approaches to the Book of Mormon. We don't occupy that space. We would never claim to usurp that position. So theology intends to signal a kind of academic background, a kind of scholarly rigor, but that intersects with that disciple side in each of us, that uh, yearning for holiness in each of us as trained scholars. So we don't intend the volumes to appeal to every Latter-day Saint even. We know this is a subset of educated English-speaking Latter-day Saints. Possible translations coming, though, for these volumes. <laughs> Um, we, we, we understand that a, that a subset of Latter-day Saints will resonate with that more scholarly approach. Um, and so we'll be watching closely uh, to see who's reading them, who's commenting on them, who attends these events, what questions you have for us, what you say on social media. Please talk back to us on social media after this, would you? Take some time. Uh, tell us what you think. Um, tell me what you think. I'm on Twitter. Um, chime in. We're going to be watching closely to see um, how these resonate. Um, but in, in, long story short, this is what we can consecrate to the Book of Mormon, is our own academic training to turn towards the saints and to try and answer that commission that's come to us from our sponsoring institutions, Brigham Young University and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we received our own apostolic commission last November as Elder Jeffrey R. Holland spoke to Maxwell Institute and challenged us to, to, to occupy this space. This is our response in a way. Is to say, this is what we can offer. This is, this is how, these are the gifts that we can lay on the altar and what we can consecrate uh, for the saints. And so this is our um, humble uh, exploratory effort uh, for, for the curriculum next year. Again, we don't expect every Latter-day Saint uh, to want to have us as conversation partners, uh, but these are certainly the conversation partners I wanted as a reflective Latter-day Saint who is not a theologian, not a philosopher, not a textual scholar. Um, but I went around, I went about seeking in part 
uh, those who do this kind of work. Uh, I wanted their help. I wanted to think along with them. And so uh, you'll help us know whether or not we're connecting and whether or not it's accessible. Um, and so thanks in advance. We appreciate it. our event this evening. Thank you very much for being here, those of you who joined us online as well. Um, please keep your eyes open for similar events with featuring it, other um, authors from our roster later this summer and this fall. So good evening. Thank you.